G'day, welcome to Australia Ask. I'm Adam McArdle. Today we're here to talk to BJ Duncan and the Duxchung Land Council. G'day. Hi Adam, how are you? Good, thank you. Before we start, Adam, I'd like to just do an acknowledgement of the country. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that this interview has been conducted on Duxchung land. Uh, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. I'd like to acknowledge our elders who we've got a saying in the land rights movement that we're standing on the shoulders of giants and I'd like to acknowledge those elders that have contributed to Dark and Junk's success. I can also acknowledge our youth that I hope for a brighter future. And as soon as our this year's 2023 NAIDOC theme is for the elders, I'd like to acknowledge elders that have maintained country and language and culture. Thank you very much, BJ. No worries, Adam. So I, I started today by saying g'day. How, how do we say g'day in Dark Junk? Yeah, look, unfortunately, Adam, with the um, the early colonialism, a lot of language wiped up. We've got a dark and young language group that's only just reformed to look at some of the language. But universally, look around our communities, is uh, happy to say Yama. Yama, BJ. Yama, Adam. So um, we're, we're here on Dukajung country today, um, and it, it's a beautiful place up here near Nora Head. It um, is. But where did your whole being start? Where, where are you from? Sure. So originally I'm from a, um, a little northwestern town in New, New South Wales, uh, a town called Moree. Um, obviously Moree's had its fair share of headlines over the years for something, but back in the bad old days of this country I was born into a segregated ward. Um, when my mum gave birth to me, uh, my old aunties brought me into the world. Uh, there was no doctor on duty. Um, those old aunties constantly remind me they could take me out of the world too, as well, Adam. <laughs> it's a very strong black matriarchal family that I come from. Mum was one of the first registered Aboriginal nurses um, in, the, in the country. Um, and her being ill at the time, we needed to move to a, a more moist climate um, that was currently existing in Moree. So my family made the collective decision to relocate to the Central Coast in about 65, 66. So almost 60 years that I've been on the coast. I'm guessing things have changed a lot since then. Oh, changed tremendously. I've seen the coast blossom to be in a little backwater town uh, into now being revitalised to be one of the major six city uh, community projects uh, that'll be coming along. You know, we're talking about a, a fast train going to Sydney within half an hour. We're talking about um, the old revitalisation of the Gosford Township Centre. Um, pretty exciting times for the Central Coast. So uh, you, you spoke about your mum, but maybe we focus a little bit on mum and dad. You know? mm, sure. What was their upbringing and, and what was their life? Sure. Um, my dad had a fairly rough upbringing in the fact that he had to leave school um, at an early age to raise uh, his siblings. Um, my grandmother, his mother, uh, passed away, um, and it's, it's hard to believe, that she, it was appendicitis. So she actually had an attack and they couldn't get to the doctors quick enough before, before actually losing her. So Dad stayed at work around um, a few of the shearing sheds up in the northwest and the New England area before securing a job with his father, working on the railways in Moree. And um, 47 years he served on the railway, um, 12 months into retirement we lost him. So I don't know what it's like not to have a meal on the table. My dad always worked. Uh, he always enjoyed life and he enjoyed the company of other people. And, you know, mum herself, she was actually uh, nursing in both Moree Hospital, Narrabri, and also Newcastle as well. So the relocation of the Central Coast for an opportunity, one for her health, but also to provide us, uh, the children who were six in total, to actually um, have a better schooling, better opportunities and stuff. So, so you, you've just mentioned six brothers and sisters. So, are, are you the lucky one to be the oldest, or? <laughs> yep. Um, unfortunately, I'm the oldest. I'm the loudest voice, and I love to talk. Apparently, <laughs> I get told. Uh, but part of that is um, a bit of responsibility as well to yeah. my other siblings. So, um, where did the other five all end up? Um, well, Vicky, my who's next to me. There's two years apart between the top four. So Vicky uh, is here on the Central Coast. She's actually the Executive Director of Brang Regional Alliance and also the Chair of Yering Aboriginal, Corpora Aboriginal Health Corporation, um, which is actually named after my mum, which is Eleanor Duncan Aboriginal Health Centre. And um, my brother, Audie, has actually relocated back to the homelands. He's back in Maury raising his little grandson. Um, Lynn, I'm pleased to say, uh, has got a long history of being involved with Aboriginal education particularly at Gorrigan Public School, where just recently they named an award after many, many years of service Just there. down the road? Just down the road, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, brought a tear to my eyes that when she actually presented that award on the day, 
Uh, unbeknownst to her, she presented it to her little granddaughter that won the award first up, and I, uh, like I said, it brought it here to my eye. Oh, you could see that that intergenerational yeah. connection. Yeah, and absolutely. the other two, um, Tracy's in Sydney. She works with the Energy um, Ombudsman, and Shane, my younger brother, is raising a family of six and doing a remarkable job as a single parent. Your parents must be very proud. Yeah, I think if they'd be around today, not just of us, but also a lot of our um, grandkids, uh, they've just, you know, which extends the line a little bit more, just doing some amazing stuff. So it, it sounds like uh, usually in a big family, everyone gets along and, you know, there's fights and whatnot, but you, you get to play a lot with each other. But, but what were some of the harder parts of your life? Oh, look, some of the harder parts of life is obviously relocating back down here to the Central Coast. There was a period of time where even mum, I think, found it a bit difficult um, because of the isolation issue. So she would actually take us home to Moree and we'd do 12 months of schooling in Moree. Um, I've got records to show that I was being assigned into an Aboriginal school at the, um, it's called Mi Crescent or the Mission in Moree. Um, but I felt that little bit of isolation as well. It was very exciting times when an old uncle or a cousin or an aunt would call into our old railway house because it gave that bit of a connection a bit more stronger. Because unfortunately the tyranny of distance here on the coast which separates a lot of Aboriginal people is that you know, if you're a young person living down the southern end of our coast around that Yamani area to get to um, San Remo or somewhere like that, it's, two, it's a train trip of two buses and uh, a lot of travel trying to connect those in, to, in together. So I think tyranny of distance was one thing. Um, I came from a community in northwestern New South Wales where there's a lot of um, very much closeness because of the family situation. And when we first relocated to the Central Coast, there's only four other Aboriginal families here as well. And now we've had an explosion to an Aboriginal population of 17,500 people. Wow. Um, and 47% of those are under the age of 18, which is an enormous amount. Um, and they're just some of the issues that, you know, sort of had to deal with. Um, one of the other, other issues, I suppose, is that when I was a young black man, Adam, back in the day, uh, I could be only one of three things. I could be a carpenter, a panel beater and a bricklayer. You know, I sit with people now on the board of Dark and Jung that, uh, you know, that are business degree qualified, um, that are law qualified, social work qualified, and I just think it's, um, it's it makes better makes us better for a community of people with those sort of qualifications. So, so while you had that um, that hard part of your life, you were just able to work through it, you know, mm. right? and and things always get better in the end. Yeah, definitely. Look, um, I think what you, what you generally see now is a lot of um, a lot of that working through and making things a lot easier is that we're at the point here now at Dark and Jungle seeing some really tangible good results coming back because you know as I said the, we've got over 3,700 hectares land and both the former Gosford and Wyong Shire 10% of that is development but it's pretty rich prime real estate as well and then those actually um, dividends that we get for the sale of those land or the development lands come back to help the direct people that the Act is um, entitled us to help and that's our membership and in fact all Aboriginal people on the Central Coast. That's probably a really good segue to explaining exactly what the Land Council is. So okay. people have probably seen the signs when they enter Dukajung country yes. but they probably don't understand what the Dukajung Land Council's actual role is. Can you explain that to us? Yeah, for sure. So basically, in a one word line that I use consistently, um, is that Dark and Jungle Local Regional Lands Council was formed under the Aboriginal Land Rights Act of 1983. The incorporation for Dark and Jungle was actually signed in my mum and dad's backyard. So 12 elders got together and decided that we wanted to do something on Dark and Jungle country. One of those was old Uncle Tommy Sales, um, pretty well revered elder from around this community, who was a Dark and Jungle man and always claimed to be a Dark and Jungle man. But the, the Aboriginal Lands Council has actually set up to prove the socio-economic basis for Aboriginal people here on the coast. And the way we do that is to acquire Crown land. We can't claim any land, it's just vacant Crown land. Um, and whilst we claim those vacant Crown lands, um, we're succeeding in not only claiming those lands, but we do a cultural study on those lands and earmark certain parcels for development. And once again, once that development comes to fruition, Money's gone back into the membership to provide our Dark and Jung Barker College, our sponsorship to elders, um, our virtual uh, funeral fund, Dark and Jung Funeral Fund. And no doubt you would have heard about Eupla going bust and you know a few of our elders out west could have gave themselves a state funeral. Our funeral fund won't go bust. 
Okay. Because it's managed by all Aboriginal people and we're accountable to the community. Very good. And, and uh, membership. So you mentioned members a few times. How do you become a member of the Dr. Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, you've got to meet the three, uh, three criteria under the Aboriginal Land Rights Act that you've got to identify as being Aboriginal. Um, you've got to be uh, Aboriginal. And thirdly, that you have to be accepted as being Aboriginal within the community. That's the three-part Lisbon test that we actually run through the Lands Council. Mm -hmm. When you apply for membership, you're asked to provide a family heritage tree, um, claiming which side your Aboriginal heritage is, and what country you're from, and what connections, plus also to a letter from a current member of Dark and Chung, and also to a, um, a community organisation that knows of you out in community. And it's quite a rigorous test. I think people get a little bit frustrated, so it's long and convoluted, convoluted but one of the things that we ask that is that um, that's one of the major issues in communities at the moment, is the um, identity of individuals. Mm -hmm. So uh, where, how big is Dukajung country? Yeah. Cool, well we go right out to um, the Wadigans, um, to as far north as just before Catherine Hill Bay, to as far south as the Derebin or the Hawkesbury River. So it's a fairly large sort of area, a geographic area. We've got beaches, we've got rainforest, we've got rural, we've got, you know, residential, and we've got, you know, two major growth areas, which yep. is Wyong, Shire and Gosford. Okay, and a bit of uh, Lake Macquarie in there as well? Yep, we touch on the edges of Lake, Lake Macquarie. We share Lake Macquarie with uh, Biraban Local Aboriginal Lands Council and a Wabakal uh, Lands Council as well. We've got a great working relationship with both those Lands Councils. So uh, while that's the landmass, how about the people? So what are the family groups which used to be here and mm. what are the family groups today? Yeah, look, um, the, the family groups here on the Central Coast have become a lot more diverse over the years. Um, my family, for instance, is um, obviously relocated uh, from Moree. We've got people that are relocated from other countries as well. We've got Rajiri, we've got Bunjalung. Um, we've got Yuan, um, we've got a lot of clan groups that have, you know, come in to call the Central Coast home. Um, and I, I strongly believe that they come here because of that opportunity to actually better their lives. Um, because face it, you know, we've got some of the best schools, we've got some of the greatest beaches, we've got some of the greatest access to health services as well. And when you look at those, some of the rural, rural and remote areas, you know, and uh, just what's happening on the news at the moment, the decline in health standards that have been delivered out there. They're relocating for a specific purpose and that's to give families a better offer. So those family groups are very strong in the fact that they're relocating here. Um, unfortunately due to date, because of colonisation, Dark and Jungle Board moved a motion some eight or nine years ago not to be the second round of dispossession. So the first round of dispossession, Adam, as you would be aware, was when Cook arrived and claimed you know, terra nullius. Uh, but what what actually um, happens here on Dark and Junk Country is that we we moved the motion that anybody could go and put their facts before the court to claim native title. To date, nobody's done that. So that's why Dark and Junk Local Aboriginal Land Council accepts the cultural authority here on the coast. Um, the group uh, that was pertaining to be traditional owners are still out there banging their drums and stuff like that. But the simple thing is, if they wanted to declare their uh, native title ownership, then go through the processes, you know, access the federal court. First thing they'll say is that there's no money yet. Federal government supplied money to actually help you with your court case. If you can provide evidence of your bona fides. Today they've been discontinued in the federal courts twice. Hence Dark and Junk's strong position that we're on uh, a cultural uh, authority basis. Okay. Um, and it, so I don't know much about um, how that works. Uh, so uh, the Land Council is authorised by law to, to own things, but there can also be cultural groups within that, that yeah. geographical location as well. Exactly. Because of my heritage, uh, being from Maori, being a Gomorrah man, I'm part of the Gomorrah native title claim. My connections go right back to a, um, a traditional owner uh, by the name of Napilia, he's actually signing blankets, uh, his name was Billy Duncan, um, and that's how far my heritage goes back to the traditional names. So part of the um, native title claim is that anybody can put a native title claim, but then it has to be proven in the federal court. And we're only asking for a fair um, roll of the dice on that. Um, if people are pertaining to be traditional owners, 
then we're saying we'll stay out of it, the argument, you go and prove it. And if it is proved in the federal court um, that they are traditional owners, then certainly I'll be the first to stand up and acknowledge those traditional owners. All right, very good. Um, historically, I, I've been told that some of the historical family groups were the Carriong, the Terrigal, the Narara. Mm. Um, is that still something which you, you can see in the area or...? No, unfortunately, Adam, due to colonisation, a lot of those groups um, have died out, and I, I hate to use that term, um, but because of the colonisation, they've been attacked, moved on um, from some of the whole lands. There's been a disconnection of family groups. We've got um, an Aboriginal group here who've got a really strong association with um, the local community, but even they are not portraying to be traditional owners. Um, and it's, it's really interesting that all those those clan groups that exist today in modern days uh, is more than the clan groups of the Wiradjuri, the Bunjalung that have come here now to call um, Darkenjung country home. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really good opportunity for us as an Aboriginal community to actually acknowledge that. So what are some of the successes the Land Council's had in your ah. years? Look, the first success I'd say is that we're, we've been given an opportunity now to embrace a, 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 an all Aboriginal membership. Um, and talk to Aboriginal people that, you know, are out there either with kids at school or sports and stuff like that. So that's the first win I think we've had as a local lands council. Go back to, to, to 83 or 84 when the incorporation was built. Um, as I said, in my mum and dad's backyard, that was uh, 12 elders who uh, brought us together to form Dark and Jungle Local Aboriginal Lands Council. But not only then, I don't think in their wildest dreams they would ever think, because I went to meetings with our lands council in the early days where we were throwing in money to rake up for biscuits and things. Some of those meetings were going to quarter to three in the morning. So it's through those shoulders of giants that I mentioned earlier that we're able now to have a large land portfolio. We've got an investment portfolio with Perpetual as well. Um, and we're managing that and then that's the next phase of us as Aboriginal people with self-determination is actually deciding what we actually do with our land and, and um, our funds. So we're getting smarter by being involved in the investment field, we're getting smarter about maintaining sites and we're even getting smarter about accessing some of the types because unfortunately they're still in, most of those sites are in the hands of National Parks and Wildlife um, and we're sort of negotiating now to get some of, a few of those sites handed back. Very good, very good. So. What is, what's the next 12 months look like for the Land Council? What are your goals for the next 12 months? Exciting times for us as a local Lands Council. Um, as you could probably be aware, we've been handed over Pete's Island or Kuran Wally. Yep. So Kuran Wally is um, uh, going to be a magnificent facility, not just for Aboriginal community, but the all of community. We want to re reactivate that island. The island, um, formerly known as Pete's Island, was shut down in 2010 and has got a bit of a checkered history about the treatment of people with disabilities and we're talking to the Centre of Intellectual Disabilities and it's hopeful that our membership will decide that we have a bit of truth telling that gets told in not just our history on Aboriginal history but also too on people with disabilities because some of the stories aren't nice but as long as we keep on ignoring those stories from the past we'll never be able to change the future. Yeah I think the um, land councils and the Aboriginal people um, with their stories and whatnot, are really good at keeping that history going. And, mm. and to be able to teach or help the people um, which were on Pete's Island mm. how to do that, I think that'd be a great benefit which you yep. could give to them down there. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, I believe you've just had a CEO retire yep. um, and you're starting the search for a new CEO. What's, what's the process of finding a CEO of a big corporation like this? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm glad you actually asked the question, Adam, because um, it's exciting times for us. So the former CEO that we had uh, was absolutely brilliant. He brought so much in the organisation, and I'll put it, I'll lay him as this, he was a getter. He went out and got us the island after many years negotiation, finalised that deal, got us some funding to be able to do, uh, reactivate the island. But now we're after a CEO, I think, that's more of a doer, to be able to push the money out the door, start the developments rolling as well. So our board um, on the 28th will be meeting to look at the package that we're going to be offering the, the new CEO to upgrade some of the statement of duties and a few other little contractual arrangements that we've got in there that really didn't fit the organisation, they more, mainly fitted the, the individual. Then I'm, I've got no doubt the board will move that we go out to full advertisement. Um, that'll be open for about two weeks 
we'll get people to apply and at that board meeting of Dark and Junk we'll nominate a, um, an interview panel to actually participate in that as well. So very much exciting times for us and we've proven that when we do go to press to advertise and recruit we get some outstanding candidates. We have formerly had um, Jeff Scott who's now Jeff's the um, CEO of, of The Voice uh, to Parliament so Jeff was with us for a while. Um, Brendan, who's just left us now, has taken a head job down in Canberra with uh, Aboriginal Affairs. Um, so he's left us, you know, to be really much a focal point of Indigenous Affairs for all of us. And I was only speaking to him on the phone. He's passionate about that, as he is still passionate about Dark and Junk. And of course, Sean Gordon. And Sean was a former CEO that now is involved on the expert panel for The Voice as well. Excellent. You raised The Voice, and it's a really critical topic mm. at the moment. Mm. So what, what is your view of the voice's purpose mm -hmm. and, and the way that it should be implemented? Yeah, look, I think for many years government's been making decisions about us without consulting Aboriginal people. It's been a very much a claw in, in our operations for self-determination here on the Central Coast. To me, it's a no-brainer. You know, the voice to Parliament will give us a better access to those ministers that are out there deciding what's best for us as Aboriginal people. The voice is not only an opportunity for um, that senior engagement, but it's also an opportunity for people that are um, fairly, fairly low down on um, the local level as well, um, to be able to express some stuff and have a bit more say into the direction that Aboriginal Affairs has taken in this nation. And to me, I think not only will non-Aboriginal people not lose 240 odd years of colonisation history, what they will gain is 65,000 years of the richest, long and surviving culture in the world. And I think as a nation, you know, don't we want that? Yeah. I, I, I do agree, but a lot of people don't know how to, to include that culture into our own mm. um, identity uh, without cultural appropriation. So what, what do you think we should be trying to do and, and what shouldn't we be trying to do? Quite easily answered. Um, we've got over, you know, 500 different nations in this country. The first thing we make a mistake that we um, constantly argue with non-Aboriginal people about is that clustering of the groups into an all-Aboriginal group. Every nation in this country is a little bit different, with a different opinion. I think looking at the individualisation of those communities that you're dealing with, and hands, you know, hands up to um, Central Coast Council, so they're working on a Central Coast uh, First Nations Accord. So it's one, uh, how council is going to be doing business with us as a, as a First Nation group, and I applaud them for the actions that they've taken. Um, I think that what we need to do is actually get across the whole way we engrave with Aboriginal people. Um, it's adoption of, and a classic, as I, I think Adam, I might have spoke to you before, is that when you look at what's happening in New Zealand today, you know they've got Maori town names, they've got Maori languages in the school that are part of the curriculum, um, the number of seats in Parliament are actually there as well and that, hopefully that's what the voice will address. But I think it's a great opportunity for this country to start adopting the name instead of having the name of colonists that were actually you know, involved with mass murderers and paying homage to those. We don't have a um, monument to Martin Bryant, you know, but why, why then are we not sort of looking at people from our community, from the Aboriginal community that, that have been there for since land rights began and you know you know the likes of Bill Ferguson, Pearl Gibbs, uh, my uncle Jacko Smith, all people that fought for the rights for us today. So um, you, you talk about the um, the names and whatnot. Um, you know in the Gosford Council we have some very bland names for our wards, East Ward, West Ward. Oh, yeah. Do you not think we should be using cultural names? You know, yeah. uh, it might be the, the Sumsby or the uh, Carry On and then the Terrigal and, and using the local old family names and, and areas. Yep. Yep. I, I totally agree with you. I think we should be doing it. We should be um, you know, really seeking that separate identity to the Central Coast. Forever our arguments that we're either Greater Sydney right, or out of Newcastle. The Central Coast is one of the most amazing geographical areas anyway. Yeah. So let's go down that track of get a uniqueness about what's here on the Central Coast. Start calling them after those clan group names and those Aboriginal names. Start identifying that you know Aboriginal language was here way before um, Mr Cook stepped foot in the country. But let's go down the track of um, true reconciliation and start that happening. So 
Earlier you mentioned language and you just mentioned it again there. Um, in inclusion of the of language, so Yama. Mm -hmm. Being proud to say Yama uh, every time we meet someone in our, in our mm. local area. Um, talking about a mob, maybe, yep. uh, and things. What are some of the other little things we can sort of do in our introductions and, and our greetings yeah. to, to bring that culture in? Yeah, look, um, there's a number of things we can do as individuals. Um, one of them I would recommend is that you, you actually get out and support our NAIDOC week. Uh, when you see some of the events that we're holding, once again, Dark and Jungle's at the forefront of putting on all of our NAIDOC events uh, because of that economic base that we've got. We don't go to government with our handout or taxpayers' money. We actually fund our uh, events through our investment portfolio and we budget for that quite strictly. But become involved with the local community to celebrate NAIDOC week. Be part of the, uh, uh, the discussion about change the date. Um, I don't think the 26th of January, which is a date, you know, stemmed in history for non-Aboriginal people, but for us as Aboriginal people it doesn't hold much reason to celebrate. So it's an opportunity to, to agree on the date. But I think agree on, the, on or changing the date is a little bit further down on my wish list of stuff. Let's start addressing the high rate of incarceration that's happening with our youth, uh, our men and women, um, and let's Let's address some of the things that are, you know, very much just talked about in Parliament, um, like closing the gap. Let's start addressing those before we even worry about a simple thing that's changing today. So th th there are some big things to go, um, but I, I believe that the Parliament is trying to get there by land rights, the apology, you know, the voice, and, and there are steps to go through. But um, can you maybe talk to me a bit about the apology, because it's something yeah. most people will, will still remember. How, how do you see that apology? Look, as a, first of all, as, a, as an Australian, and then, then as an Aboriginal man, as an Australian, I think it's suddenly realised, driven home, this happened. This is not something that happened a couple of hundred years ago. This is stuff that happened as recently as 19, the 1970s. And in fact, Adam, still happening today with the amount of young Aboriginal kids that are in out-of-home care. Particularly here on the Central Coast, we've got over 700 young people in out-of-home care. I think as an Aboriginal man, um, I wept when the apology was given. Not only was Kevin Rudd brave enough to do that um, and apologise things, I could see the raw emotion up in the gallery from people that, you know, first of all, the people that was affected by the stolen generation. And it's, and it's really upsetting to see that today I'm still coming in contact with those people that were part of the stolen ge generation that are still emotionally torn by the whole process. And then the institutional trauma that's been transferred de down for a generation for kids um, is just really appalling. So I think that the stolen generation um, is a topic that's part of our history, you know, it's part of our right. Uh, and when I mentioned earlier about the confirmation of identity, we've got people that are struggling because they claim that they're part of the stolen generation. Yet we've got, you know, organisations such as Link Up that are there to help people reconnect. We shouldn't have to join the dots as a local lands council. The journey that they need to go on is with the likes of Link Up and doing some background uh, about some of the cultural um, needs that they want and also some of the identities that they need to follow up. So I. You know, very quickly. So my uh, last name Duncan is a bastardisation of Duncan. So when I did my native title claim, I actually went to the historian, which was a, he was a fantastic guy called Michael Bennett with the Native Title Services Corp. Michael and I sat down and I said to Michael, I said, look, I'm pretty switched on with the Aboriginal side, mate. Can you give me something how the non-Aboriginal side got into it? So we went through a long process, and the the actual um, Duncan Duncan was a bastardisation of Duncan. So he was the first lieutenant to come out here on the first fleet and then his actual ancestry goes back to, to England and he's actually a direct descendant of William the Conqueror. But I don't claim my English heritage, you know, I only know my Aboriginal cultural heritage and that's the most important thing is that I've got family that I claim but more importantly I've got mob that claim me as well. Yeah. And it's a big thing and I think, uh, as I mentioned to you, you know, I didn't spend much time in Maury growing up as a kid, did a bit of schooling there, go home quite regularly for funerals, family get-togethers and stuff like that. But it's funny, I still call Maury home, you know, and I've lived on the Central Coast almost 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do identify um, uh, 
I remember once being asked, uh, so where are you from? I said, Australia. And they said, oh, no, no, back. And I went, Australia. Yeah. And they went, no. And I went, well, I suppose someone once upon a time came from Ireland. Yeah. And they went, oh, so you're Irish? I went, no, yeah. I'm Australian. Yeah. And even now with my, my family, we lived away for a little while and we yeah. came home to, to the Central Coast of Dhaka Jungle Land. Mm. And this is home. Yes. Yeah, this is my country. This is nice. who I identify with. This is home for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the purpose of those signs, as you mentioned earlier, too, Adam, is that, that we put those signs up um, through a lot of discussion, through a lot of arguments and stuff like that, just to keep on reminding people that this is dark and junk country. Yeah. You know, not only is it one of the richest, most beautiful areas, I think, in the eastern border of, um, of this country, but, you know, there's some damn good people that live here as well. And they come from good working class backgrounds to a later, you know, settle with their kids after generation generation. And particularly those developments, one of the key issues is that Central Coast is expanding. Like it or not, you know, how the housing boom is either coming or on its way. And, and what we've got to remember is that not just Aboriginal people will be looking for roofs over there, non-Aboriginal people as well. And Dark and Jung's best situated at the moment to provide some of that housing. And we want to contribute to this community. And, and uh, I think that's one thing which I've seen uh, locally is you want to contribute. Mm. You want to be part of this community and a leader in this community and, and all credit to the uh, association. Um, I wanted to come back. You, you said something in the stolen generation, which I'd, I'd never heard, that, that there's still people being taken today. We haven't learned our lesson. We apologise, but that's still happening today. And the rates you were talking about, uh, are, they, are they almost as high as the yeah. original? They're, they're almost on par with the stolen generation that was happening in the, um, in the 70s to what they are today. We've got some amazing services here, plus um, like Yarra and Edelard Duncan Aboriginal, they do an out-of-home care um, project and do a marvellous job. But they're trying to get those kids now back connected with Aboriginal families as well. And there's other organisations that are out there working at the coalface. Um, and many years ago they decided they would employ Aboriginal people in those positions. But those Aboriginal people aren't in positions to make decisions. You know, they're just seen as a bit of pretty much make up the numbers in government and then that's it. So that, that's where I was leading is, that's one of the things the voice can help with. Yes. This is an issue and this is how we think it could be fixed. Yep. Yeah. Oh, my, most, most definitely. Um, unfortunately with that identity issue is that we have a lot of people claiming to be Aboriginal because there's a perceived benefit of being Aboriginal. You've got access to jobs, you've got access to housing, uh, free Medicare and stuff like that. It's disappointing, Adam, that nobody from the Holocaust is claiming that they're part of the Holocaust. Because why? There's no benefit associated with the Holocaust. And whilst we always talk about the Holocaust being the most dangerous time in the history of humanity, I think the removal of our kids and the stolen generation is on par with that. They're yeah. really on par with it. And, and it should be remembered in the same way, through, yes. through movies and culture. Yes. And stories. Yes, most of them. So one thing we hear about are uh, storylines. Can you explain what a storyline is? Sure. So a storyline is um, a, a group of people, Aboriginal people, that would trek through this country, um, whether it be hunting or gathering, but would then sit and actually have a meal, do ceremony, discuss. And those ceremony or storylines are actually linked to a dreaming stories that go back, and particularly in this area, to Mount Yango. So Mount Yango is pretty much what we call no man's land, so we don't own Mount Yango. A lot of uh, the, the Northern End Land Council, we share ownership of, of that facility. And it was not just now, but in traditional times, it was pretty much an area where people did a lot of trading. So a lot of trading in stone implements, uh, language and wives. So a few Gomeroy languages that suddenly appeared down here in Dark and Junk Country, um, swapping of wives happened before. Um, the stone artefacts, so we've discovered skeletal remains buried with their stone axes and the rocks on the stone axes aren't from here because this is a lot of sandstone basin all around here. It's really hard, heavy balsa rock. So uh, from up around my area, the Gomorrah used to come down and trade as well. So, you know, it's steeped in history. Those storylines all point to Mount Yengo and there's many dreaming stories associated with that. So it's the dreaming stories around the pelican, around the whale, uh, and even kangaroo. Can you maybe tell us one of the stories? Yeah, um, look, we've got a site up at Warriwarren. 
So outside the cave um, that's associated with the whale dreaming stories, there's a quite a remarkable rock there that as when you stand back and look at it, you can see that it's a whale. Yeah. So therefore the significance of that. So why we had totems and stuff like that is because if that was part of your totem, you couldn't eat that totem. It was treated like a brother or a sister to you, to the clan group. And that then allowed for the survival of species over the years. So they wouldn't go there and eat out everything that was there. So certain groups couldn't sell any other groups with them. But those storylines evolve around the traditions that we even have today, you know, about, about giving knowledge to local kids about some of the sites, the history of the sites, the travel of the sites. And when you look at Bulgandry and those sites there, it's actually Bulgandry, you can see that one of the figures there has got a hand up for a stop sign and pointing away. And that tells the story of a women's birthing site that's down there. That the um, not to go that way, go the other way, so that you don't impede on the the cultural value of that site. You, you spoke earlier about New Zealand being a good example of culture being in the schools. Mm. If some of the teachers here from the primary schools or secondary schools would like um, someone to come along and teach story mm. and the history of the area, yep. how how do they reach out? Well, I've just contacted us at Dark Young mm. Local Aboriginal Lands Council. We've got a cultural um, cultural tourism manager is quite up to speak with a lot of the, the cultural heritage from around this area. Some of our cultural heritage officers are able to bring some implements along to explain what the implements we use for. Um, and we've got one of the most remarkable resources that uh, out there, and that's our elders. We can get some of the elders to go into schools and promote our culture amongst with kids. And I don't know about you, Adam, but I've always seen kids quieting down when an elder walks in there. <laughs> yeah, always, always. always. <laughs> kids like to hear stories. They want to they know, do. they want to learn. Yeah, so. yeah most definitely. So um, we, we spoke a bit about the voice at a national level. Um, it, it seems to be a stepping stone on its way through. Mm. Um, locally, how do you see, you, you spoke of that the council is trying to work on a, mm. I don't think treaty was the word you used, but mm. an agreement. Maybe should we also, as we're about to restructure our council here, add a voice at the same time? So mm. there is a voice in council and, mm. and a treaty or an agreement also with the council and, and the group? I think you're living my dream, Adam. If we can get on with council to declare two spots on there for Aboriginal representation, I'm all for that. But realistically, that's not going to happen. Um, because council's very heavily involved with party lines and stuff like that, it makes it really hard. Although we've seen a shift away from government type bases into now the tool in the, in the federal election, um, I'd be very interested to see how the state election goes as well. But certainly us, on a local level with The Voice, it reaches far, far beyond what we could ever dream by getting access to, to ministers, to government, so that we can actually be part of the decision making for us that really hasn't included us in part of the conversation over all those years. So The Voice and Dark and Jungle Lands Council is part of the Barang Regional Alliance, so that's an empowered communities model. Uh, Vicky Parry, my sister, who I mentioned earlier, is the executive director on there. Uh, they're looking at a major campaign now to involve all the organ Aboriginal organisations of the coast to have a focus about the voice so we can go on it. Because we're back to 1967. Yeah. We're relying on the goodwill of non-Aboriginal people to vote in favour of the voice. I think the majority of non-Aboriginal people in this country would support the voice. But it's the smoke and mirrors being thrown up by, uh, you know, the opposition and the Greens and stuff and uh, formerly, the, or some of the Greens, that, you know, it's something that really needs to get behind to unite this whole country. And I think it'll have a trickle-down effect as well. So as, as at a local level, we'll have more say in what affects us. So um, one of the arguments I am starting to see trend um, against The Voice is it's not enough. What, what's your view on that? Well, not perfect? Well, look, I don't, I don't think it's not perfect, but then what is today? Um, I think that there's got to be a foot in the door somewhere and there's got to be a buy-in from everybody. As long as we don't have something like the voice enshrined in the, in the parliament, then everybody will always have an opinion of what's best for Aboriginal people. But like I said, it's 2023, not 1823. Let's start including us as some of those discussions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, white men need to stop trying to fix the problem. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with the, with the storylines and, and the culture, we, we spoke about the children being able to learn it. You've talked about NAIDOC Week. Mm -hmm. Are there other ways that um, 
that uh, people which are proud to live mm. in Dukajun country able yeah. to get involved? Yeah, look, I, I think Adam, I'm part of the Police Aboriginal Community Consultative Group, um, and it's it's about making Aboriginal people welcome in non-traditional areas. So um, we've got a great inspector that's involved with the pack, um, you know, and he has offered to you know see if he can make arrangements to get kids involved in the rowing at surf club and things like that. Traditionally, surf clubs aren't being known to attract a strong Aboriginal population, but we've got to get across to our kids. They're a part of this community as much as a non-Aboriginal person or an Italian person or something like that. So those no-go areas is a, an opportunity for us to get them out to community. And then that opens their broader perspective about who, who they engage with. Because they'll meet somebody that's intriguing, that's fascinating to them, and then they can see that, you know, whilst they can maintain their Aboriginal cultural identity, they can also make friends with non-Aboriginal people as well. Yeah. And there's many doors that have been opened on the football field. Due many, to very, many. Very simple thing. Yeah. So, BJ, we've spoken a lot about the past and, and the present, mm -hmm. but uh, as the name implies, Australia asks, we have some questions from the public. Oh, yeah. So uh, the first one is from Seth in Kenwell. He asks, what is the Uluru Statement of the Heart? Mm. Look, I think at the basic principles of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, of which I was one of the delegates at, so my name appears on, on the statement as well. And by far, I think in my generation and the work that I've done over many communities, that it's been my crowning glory. So Uluru Statement of the Heart is once again Aboriginal people um, pleading for the rest of Australia to get behind and shine a voice in Parliament. Um, a couple of good things about the statement is that, you know, we're not an inherent criminal society. Um, we've been pushed sometimes into situations that have got people into a bit of strife and raised the uh, prison population. You know, we have had land dispossessed and now want to talk about, you know, and the Aboriginal Land Rights Act, Adam, as I said before, that we can only claim vacant Crown land. Uh, that is a minuscule of the land that's available here in this country. Um, and whilst the argument for sovereignty is out there, I think what the basic uh, principle behind the little statement of the heart is just to let's go with that dialogue and start it by putting a voice to be enshrined in Parliament. Okay. Um, so with, with that, uh, when I watched that and, and heard it, I, I saw a people which had been suffering for 230 years mm. still wanting to include. It wasn't about mm. take over or whatever. They just want to include in our uh, in your culture, you, mm. you're inviting us in almost. Again, yeah. again, and this was goes back to 1938 with the day of uh, mourning site in, in Sydney and the first fight for Aboriginal land rights. It was actually inviting non-Aboriginal people to come in and enter into the debate about you know, land rights for us. So here we are in 2023 wanting to talk about inviting non-Aboriginal people back into the conversation of issues that affect us and our generational aspirations and a generational trauma so it's really important that once again you know we're, we're not a confrontational community uh, of people we're people just wanting the best for our own people so the next question is from jackie from point claire mm -hmm. and she asks that with the 300 nations you mentioned earlier is there a possibility of maybe federating them into the australian mm -hmm. commonwealth yeah. Um, if, if you don't mind, Adam, I won't speak on behalf of those 300, uh, all of the other, probably more than 300 nations that are in this country, uh, Adam. But I just know what my community wants, um, what this community is asking for, um, particularly us as a local lands council, with that a co a cultural authority to ask that, is that we want the best what's available for this community full stop. Um, we don't want to be confrontational about it. We want to enter into deep and meaningful conversation and engagement about the whole process. And we just don't want uh, to treat Aboriginal people with respect. Uh, we want all Aboriginal people to be treated with respect and value their opinions. So in the last two questions, you both times you spoke about confrontation. How do you handle confrontation like that because um, it's clear that it happens when mm. it, it's coming towards you how do you handle confrontation like that uh, well i think you know we've had many many practices at it uh and i, I mean that in a, an open and respectful manner uh 
blatant racism. There's a difference between confrontational ra and then racism itself. And unfortunately, a lot of the things that we come across is just blatant racism. I can go back to our Halakalani development and us meeting with the community up around Budgerwoy. You know, it, that, that night that that meeting was held, it was later said by one of the people in attendance, they asked us the first time they felt threatened for their life. Um, and it's an opportunity that when we do get that, we're constantly always going to have that role of educators, whether it be educators about us as Aboriginal people, educators about Aboriginal land rights and stuff like that. I think that's part and parcel of the job. But now, uh, particularly with The Voice, we see that our role is gaining with the, the economic prosperity because there's still that noble savage view that we should be standing on one leg just surveying all the land all wonderful, but not why our people are the highest representation in the youth justice system, not why our people are the highest in the adult and female prison um, thing, and there's also why our people are the most homeless and socially disadvantaged group in the country. Why can't we be part of the economic prosperity of this country as well? We are one of the great powerhouses of the world. Uh, okay. We punch well above our weight. And it, there should be some for everyone, yep. absolutely. Um, you, you spoke about um, the youth and as an elder, I can see that teaching responsibility, mm. but it's very hard to ask a young black man or a young black woman mm. to be an educator. Yeah. Um, as it is a white yeah. young man or a young woman, mm. you know, there, there's all that passion built up in yeah. them. And, and it, it, we see it as a great benefit in mm. climate change. They, they are something they are really focused on and they are driving so hard Most to try and convince older people like ourselves to mm. actually hear what they're saying. Yeah. How, how can you, what's a piece of advice you can offer to all young people when that rush of blood comes? What, mm. What's a piece of advice as an elder you can offer? Cool. Uh, well, first of all, Adam, my job that puts bread on the table my week, I work with Central Coast Community Legal Centre. So my position is Senior Aboriginal Youth Community Navigator. So it's looking at some sort of systemic uh, things that are happening and why our kids are ending up in the criminal justice system. Um, I think the, the, the main thing, is just if we can reinstate to our kids that they're valued. Um, kids today don't feel much valued because nobody asks them an opinion about anything. Um, and just recently the Barang Regional Alliance that I mentioned Duck and Jung is part of held a youth conference up at um, Point Wollstonecroft. So 100 and, 147 kids. And during that time when those youth were there, um, we ran a survey. And Aboriginal people have been the most surveyed group I know that. But this survey was done by young people to see exactly what they see as the most outstanding issues. And it really knocked my socks off because these young people said that social isolation, that if you know, young Peter's down at um, Liz and Woi Woi and he makes friends with San Remo, it's a good three and a half hours round trip to get up there and spend a bit of time. So social isolation. Um, the other thing is that they are really concerned about the availability of drugs on the coast, which stood out as well. So how readily uh, hardcore drugs are available out on the streets of the Central Coast. One youth even saying that he just has to walk to the corner of his street and get some home delivery type stuff if he really wanted to. And the other thing was about, um, you know, the opportunity to get into some sort of accommodation. Well, say youth accommodation was a major issue. I would have always thought that if, you know, if I had to predict the outcome of that survey, it would be jobs, you know, uh, an opportunity for sporting. Um, and some of the other things about that the, the came out of with the social and emotional well-being, um, which was a really major factor as well. So very, very interesting results from the survey. Once again, young people, surveying young people. Perhaps uh, one of the things we can take from that is to build a, a youth uh, advisory board for the local police command so they can yeah. understand what what is of concern to them. If, if drugs are a concern, I'm sure the police would want to do that, but they're having to do other work, if yeah, you know and, what I mean. And, and hats off to New South Wales Police, the PAC committee that I spoke about earlier. Um, I co-chaired that with a young young Aboriginal man um, from Gagari in um, uh, Ireland, or f the former Fraser Island, but Joseph has been a young boy who's been raised here on dark and young country. He co-chairs that PAC with us as well, so once again there's a young person in a bit of an authoritative role, being able to talk on um, Aboriginal youth as well. And, you know, a credit to young Joseph, he's, he's just an outstanding young man um, that's involved with our community and we're, we're very honoured and blessed to have him there. Very good, very good. So, they were the two questions we had. 
If anyone else has any other questions, jump on the website, have a look who we're interviewing coming up and give us the questions. We would love to ask the questions that you want to hear. That's how we keep our voice and keep our regional identity, is by asking the questions that you want to hear. But uh, BJ, let's move on to the future here. Yep. So let's start with what's the future for the Land Council in your eyes? Well, in 20 years time, where do you want to see the Land Council and go, we succeeded? Yeah, look, I, I think in 20 years time, I'd like to see a a more better, well-connected community to, uh, to just about everything here on the coast, whether that be schooling, um, whether that be health, whether that be housing. Um, I would not like to see some of the social problems that exist in other communities. And if people give us the opportunity, we can make some radical change in that area through our developments such as Lake Memora and Carry On. Um, I'd like to see that we as a society are a lot more open to the Aboriginal uh, perspective on things. We spoke earlier about Aboriginal names and stuff like that. Uh, I like to think also that in 20 years time, Dark and Jung would be in a more stronger position, both financially, um, culturally and spiritually, um, because the bottom line is that we, we as Aboriginal people have always maintained our cultural, spiritual connection to country. Uh, and we, it's an inherent thing that just gets handed down through generation and generation. So I think that uh, you, us as a community, if we've got those things nailed, I think the whole of the Central Coast community could benefit. And then obviously the whole of country. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think that you've got tens of thousands of years experience in living in this country. Mm. If we want to live in a symbiotic relationship with, with this country, we need to learn from that. Yeah. Um, leads into the next one, the Central Coast as a whole. Where do, where do you think we should be heading in you know, 20 to 50 years? Um, building up, staying in villages? What, what, what's your view? Yeah. Um, secondly, let's not jump ahead 15 to 20 years. Adam, let's go over the next 12 months. Okay. Once again, us as Aboriginal people, we're relying on a majority vote for a voice in Parliament. Let's get behind the voice to Parliament. Don't listen to the smoke and mirrors of, you know, whether it be the opposition or other people pertaining to represent Aboriginal people. This is an opportunity for this country to make radical change. Um, 15 to 20 years, us on the Central Coast, um, I just wanted to be in the same position that it is now, to be quite honest with you. It's the land of milk and honey. Families can relocate here and have an amazing upbringing. We discussed, you know, you're originally from um, the Gossett area and I'm originally an ex Gossett High School um, student, you know, there was never that that colour thing that come in at all back in those days. You know, if you met a good bloke, he was a good bloke. If you, if you want to play girl, footy with you, you're if more you want to play footy, to... exactly. <laughs> um, but we've just got to get away from that notion that the only Aboriginal people we love are the ones that have got a tennis racket in their hand or got a football tucked under their arm. Um, there's a lot more to us as a nation, and I think uh, uh, when people start to realise that, then, you know, we're at the Central Coast will deserve that title of being a separate standalone area. It's not being part of outer Sydney or, you know, inner Sydney or outer Newcastle, but an actual standalone identity. Yeah, I honestly believe we are a, yes. a standalone region and we need to be treated as such. Totally. Um, so what's the, you were talking about the surveys with the kids, mm. but from your position and, and the local Duck Jump people, what are the biggest setbacks that you can see or concerns in society for, which we've got to overcome to yeah. get to that next bit? Um, I think, well, well I just topped the, uh, touched that topic a moment ago, it's that separate identity stuff. Um, people will tell you that we've got the greatest schools, we've got the greatest beaches here on the Central Coast, but we've also got the highest rate of youth suicide, um, which people don't want to talk about. We've also got the highest rate of youth unemployment. And Dark and Junk for further develops and such as our Bushel Ridge where it'll be a commercial development and the leasing of blocks of lands. We're addressing some of those. Um, I don't see any other groups out there that are actually just besides um, council that may be uh, lobbying other businesses to get here. But we're specifically about getting jobs here for young people as well. Um, it's just a classic on Tuesday night. I was down at the Mooney Mooney Progress Association after talking to them. I had a contractor come up and he offered a, um, a plumbing apprenticeship. He said he's happy to take on a mature one as well. And that's the barriers that we're trying to break, yeah. you know. We've we got to stop telling kids at all these workshops or, or, or open days about if you don't become a public servant, then really you're nothing. 
there's a lot more opportunities out there for Aboriginal people. There's plumbing, there's electrical, there's, there's building trades, there's all sorts of things. There's, there's the health fields as well. And I think that's the greatest thing that we have to come across is not narrow our views, so as to restrict kids and the wild anticipation of what they can and can't be. Yeah, I'm a strong believer in uh, the youth education. You know, I was very lucky that I was given my apprenticeship. Yeah. And I think it's something which we need to focus on. Yeah, and I think, look, there's organisations that are doing some amazing stuff out there at the moment, like RIS. Uh, RIS's engagement with the youth on the Central Coast here is simply amazing. And hats off to that that team that work at RIS. Um, they've carried the brunt of what we should have been doing with Aboriginal kids for many years. Um, and, you know, Kim and her, her board and her staff out there are just an amazing bunch of people. Yeah. And that's, that's what we aspire to be. They're just a group of people interested in the best interests of young people whilst listening to what their needs are. Normally we ask, what, what's Australia look like in 50 years? Right. But that's a, that's a very uh, short time. Mm. You know, for people which have been here for 230 years, that seems like a long time. Mm. But for a people which have been here for tens of thousands of years, what does the future of Australia look like longer term? Um, I think the future of Australia will look like having a lot more identity, whether that be Aboriginal identity, I don't know. I would love for it to be, but we're no, no longer a colony of England. <laughs> you know, we're no longer just a standalone little nation that will support anybody in a fight. Uh, we're a pretty mature country that has some really strong beliefs and, and really strong cultural bringing. So, you know, I would love to say that in 50 years' time, 60 years' time, 100 years' time, that the Aboriginal focus here on the Central Coast will have towns with Aboriginal land. We'll have language being taught in school. We'll have a, a whole host of Aboriginal perspective on everything. You know, that people will, will grow accustomed to that as just a normal day, a day uh, event. Yeah. So, yeah, people like myself being able to identify that, mm. well, not Dukajung, we, we come from Dukajung country and we're proud of our country. Yeah. We're yes, proud of our heritage. Totally, Adam, and um, that happens in New Zealand now. You just have to look at anybody, anybody you run into from New Zealand, whether they be a Pākehā or, or of Maori descent, you know, they, they actually know the Maori meaning of the town and can speak apart Maori and stuff like that. Yeah. And it's just such a, an amazing culture. Sounds great. Well, thank you very much, BJ. Now, at the start, you taught me how to say hello in uh, Duck John. How hmm. do we say goodbye? Uh, we say yalu in, yalu in my language, and I'd like to just say Yellow to everybody out there today. Yellow Australia, thank you for joining us on Australia Us. Thank you very much, BJ, for joining us. Come back, hit the like and subscribe, and come back and see the next episode. Thank you very much, BJ. Beautiful. Thanks, Adam. Pleasure. Cheers.